There's several passages in the Pali Canon where King Basenity has been reflecting about the Dharma. And then he comes and he tells the Buddha about his amazing discoveries. And they're all pretty basic. Here's someone who never thought about the Dharma before. And one of his discoveries one day is that you know, people who behave unskillfully are leaving themselves unprotected. Even if they have a huge army, they're still unprotected. Whereas people who behave skillfully, even if they have no army at all, are very well protected. It's good to think that, good to keep that point in mind. We look around us and civilization seems pretty uncertain. The economy, the society, the values of the society, everything seems to be falling down, falling apart. And how do you keep yourself protected in a case like that? Well, it's through your virtue and generosity and your goodwill. The qualities that the Buddha calls treasures, your sense of conviction and the principle of karma, your virtue, your compunction, your sense of shame, your knowledge of the Dharma, your generosity, your discernment. These things are your protection. So we work on developing these things. Sometimes we're afraid that the things we try to build up as we go through life will get torn down. And you have to face the fact that, yes, they will. They, maybe they get torn down more quickly than you might have thought, but they're all going to get torn down one way or another. We'd like to leave our marks on the world, but who knows what will be left. Years back, I was visiting my father in Virginia. He was now living in Williamsburg. And when I was a teenager, we lived in Charlottesville. And as a family, we'd build a house. We'd hired some builders, but the family worked together on the house as well. Designing it, painting it, Dad did the cabinets in the kitchen. And so one day he decided he wanted to go see the old house. So we drove up and discovered that the current owners were not taking care of it at all. It was beginning to fall apart. And on the way back, he mentioned to me, he looked back in his life and he couldn't see that there was anything he had left. It had all been destroyed one way or another starting with a farm, his job with the government. Of course, I like to think that at least I was there, something he'd created that was good. But it got me to thinking, if you try to measure the worth of your life in the terms of things you can accomplish outside, it's going to seem pretty hopeless. And the more you try to build up protection against in the changes that are going to happen, if you build up in things that have nothing to do with the goodness of the heart, it's all going to get torn down. And sometimes the things that you build up as your security are going to get turned against you. So you have to remember, as you're thinking about what kind of life you want to live, it's going to have some meaning. And it will continue to have meaning even if things change very quickly and drastically. You have to look at the qualities of the mind. These are the things that are really solid and are not destroyed by events outside, unless you let the events outside destroy them. In other words, you decide that things get so bad that you're going to abandon the Dharma. But otherwise, they're there. As the Thais like to say, fire doesn't burn them, water doesn't wash them away. The wind doesn't blow them away. Nobody can steal them. Or in the phrase of the canon, kings can't take them, thieves can't take them. It's interesting they put kings and thieves in the same, same sentence. And these are the treasures we're working on right here. It's because of our conviction and the principle of karma that our lives are shaped by our actions. And our actions are shaped by our intentions, and our intentions are shaped by the mind. That's why we've got to train the mind. That's the principle of conviction. And it carries through our outside activities as well, in terms of virtue, shame, and compunction. Realizing that we don't want to harm anybody. Now, not harming doesn't mean not hurting their feelings. 
This is an important <coughs> distinction to make. If you let other people's feelings run your life, you find that you are going to start some doing th some things that really have nothing to do with the Dharma at all. Harming other people means basically getting them to see things in such a way that they start breaking the precepts. So you don't break the precepts yourself, you don't get others to break the precepts. You would be ashamed to do behavior like that, and you realize the consequences. And you're alive to the consequences. That's what compunction means. It's the opposite of apathy. And as you find a sense of well-being inside here, then it's a lot easier to be more generous with others. So we're working on many of these treasures right now. Then, of course, there's discernment, realizing what's really important in life and what's not. It's the goodness of your mind that's really going to be important, and that's really going to see you through. You read about other times when civilization has collapsed, and the people who survived the best were the ones who were spontaneous in helping one another. This is where the virtues. <laughs> qualities of generosity and goodwill come in. Because if you amass a lot of wealth for yourself, do you think the people around you are going to rest content and say, well, that's his wealth and it's his, and I'll leave it alone? You're going to have to share if you're going to survive. So it's good to develop that attitude that survival is best when it's done skillfully. And it's worthwhile when it allows you to maintain the skillfulness of the mind. And of course, there's the principle that whatever good you do is going to go with you, wherever you go. So you benefit now, you benefit on into the future. By working on your genuine protection, which is also your genuine inner wealth. So think about that, generosity and goodwill. The two principles go together, but they're different. Goodwill is something you can make universal. In fact, you have to make it universal if you want to get the most benefit out of it. But that doesn't mean you're going around protecting everybody. That's a huge misunderstanding that comes from that passage in the Garnani Amata Sutta about the mother looking after her only child. In the same way, you'd say you develop an unlimited mind of compassion and goodwill for the world. This doesn't mean that you regard the entire world as a mother would regard her child. Because there's no way you can do that. It's humanly impossible. What the Buddha is saying, you protect your goodwill as a mother would protect her child. In other words, no matter how people behave, you have to have goodwill for them. As the Buddha said, even if bandits were sawing off your limbs with a two-handled saw, they had you pinned down, there's nothing you could do, you'd still have to have goodwill for them. That's something you would have to protect, even as you realize you couldn't protect your life at that point. So goodwill can be unlimited. Generosity, however, has its limits. Each of us has only so many resources, so much time, so much energy. And you have to be careful. If you want to make the most of your generosity, where you're going to give and where you can't give. a lot of people for whom you have goodwill, but you realize that you can't help them. It's beyond your capacity. These can include not only people who are far away, but often people in your own family. It's not an act of kindness just to give in to people's demands. You have to decide, are the demands reasonable? Well, they in line with the Dharma. As the Buddha said, generosity is best when it doesn't harm you or harm the other person. So there are limits on generosity. On the one hand, the Buddha said, give wherever you feel inspired, where you feel the gift would be well used. In other words, he's not imposing any restrictions on your generosity. But then the question comes up, when a gift is given, where does it bear the best fruit? And the Buddha said, well, that's a different question. 
That's where you have to be very careful about who you give to, what you give. Looking at your intention, looking at the gift itself, looking at the recipient, looking at the time and place, exercising your discernment around these issues. So generosity becomes a skill. And it really does become a protection. So we work on these qualities, not just because they're sentimental and nice, but they really do make a difference between survival that's where it's worth surviving and not. The Ajahn's going to the forest in Thailand had to take a lot of goodwill for all the animals, all the thieves and other people living in the forest. It's not like you go out in the forest and you meet the best people all the time. You have to learn how to be accommodating with all kinds. And your goodwill and your generosity are things that help you survive. No matter where you go, you go into a new society where you don't know anybody, goodwill and generosity are the things that will carry you through. When things begin to break down, goodwill and generosity will carry you through. So remember, your protection lies in your goodness, it lies in the skillfulness of your intentions and the discernment with which you carry those intentions out. Those are the things that will see you through it no matter what happens. That's why the Buddha taught them as the Dharma, because they've been true all the time as civilizations rise and fall and then rise again. These are the qualities that make human life worth living. Make it the kind of life that we can get the most out of it. Regardless of how things rise and fall outside. 